Um, Māori ana koutou, everybody. Thank you so much for having your ears uh, here this morning. And I'm, I'm really, really grateful to all of you out there. I'm incredibly grateful to Creative Mornings for having me. So, um, yeah, I'm going to get into it. I'm, I'm relatively uh, good at having quite a lot of slides for, for not a lot of time. So come with me on a journey of... Um, scrolling through some images and doing a bit of talking. And as Ryan said, if you can, you know, if you've got questions or thoughts, please chuck them in the chat. He's keeping a, a safe eye on what's going on out there for me. Uh, but yeah, to, to start where I come from, it's, it's this beautiful city, Tamaki Makoto, and this image of the Waitamata, this is, this is the harbour I grew up alongside. Um, and if you, if you can stare right down the barrel of that image, there's a tiny little grey silhouette in between Rangitoto and Browns Island, which is Pakihi Island. So that is the land that my Scottish forebears purchased back in the 1800s when they came here because of the clearances in the highlands. So my connection to this harbour is quite long standing. Um, I had a yachty for a father uh, and uh, yeah, it means a lot to me to be able to live alongside the shores of this incredible place. Um, oh, exciting, it's making the dinghy noise. Fantastic. So then who I am, it, it's important to say this morning, I'm definitely talking from the perspective of my day job at, at Panuku, uh, which is part of council. Uh, don't judge me harshly because I work for council. Um, this is to hopefully reveal some bits of council that if you're, um, if you're out there thinking, guru council, here's another window into what we do. But also I wouldn't be here talking to you if it wasn't for the great gift of, of the mahi I get to do for a day job. So um, acknowledging uh, the place I work, but also acknowledging that it's a complex place, uh, but we're here to work for our city. I didn't always work for Auckland Council. Um, as somebody early in the chat pointed out, I started in showbiz and um, I always tend to use this image. This is me uh, standing in for Kelly Rowland when she didn't turn up for rehearsals at the Louis Vuitton 150th birthday party show in Hong Kong. Uh, and the reason I use this image is because it's become a bit of a metaphor for city making for me. Um, uh, in this moment, these were two of the most patient men I've ever met in my life. Uh, they put up with me not being able to dance for about two and a half minutes. But it reminded me and reminds me that the way that we make things is by knowing what you're good at and respecting other people and what they're good at. Uh, and this, in this particular job, I was much better backstage. Um, uh, Louis Vuitton's not a great example of not having a lot of money to do stuff, but, but when we all work together with all of our different skills, we can make magic happen. So um, it's a strange thing to have walked out of a theatre career into a career building cities and finding so many of those skills transferable. But I think if there's one message I'm hoping to say to you today is that those with creative minds, my goodness, we need you right about now. So Panuku is the city's regeneration agency. We are, we are born out of the waterfront Auckland crew who made places like Silo Park, continue to look after places like Silo Park, and also Auckland Council Property Limited, which looks after all of council's non-service portfolio. Council owns a lot of property in Auckland, um, not, not just train stations and parks, but also uh, forests and shops and things like that. So that's our job is looking after those places. And now hopefully bringing some of that regeneration into other parts of the city. So we're working in about 18 places in, in a development respect or a regeneration respect. So it's pretty amazing. But this is our strap line. This is, this is the thing that carries us through our, our day jobs. And it means an awful lot. I'm going to visit this slide a few times in this talk, so I'll move on. I got the job back in 2011 because of that theatre career. Um, the, my first boss, the wonderful Kieran Goodall, said we needed uh, the contact list I came with, but also the understanding of how you make places that are, that are good for humans and, and the understanding of programming and kind of attracting an audience. This is from a movie, not a video, four movies, before video, sorry, from a man called William White, and it's called The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces. So if you haven't seen it, well worth a watch, it's not that long. He's the grandfather of placemaking, the man who kind of started to observe that we're doing a bad job of designing places for people and then we're wondering why people aren't there. So groovy, 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 uh, super eight uh, film of, of New York City and pretty basic observations like this one. And then um, I'm including this quote from Stuart Niven. It's one of the most early instructions I was given in terms of how we do placemaking. And for the waterfront, it was a good instruction. We, we're spending a lot of money making this new public space for Auckland. We need to make sure it's relevant to humans. And this image was also one of the few instructions I was given at the beginning, uh, this drawing of how energy should be treated in the space, which made a lot of sense to a theatre maker. So when you hit Karanga Plaza, or it was then called Gateway, it's a gentle welcome. You can come and find your feet. And then as you make your way down to Silo Park, the energy builds. That still guides the way we program the space today. And we're pretty proud. It's a pretty amazing place to get to work for. And it's a sort of say hashtag team sport a lot. But this is because we've got security guards that care and people like Fresh Concept that are just 
my goodness, those people have given so much energy to this space over the last decade. We've got structures like the silos that were chosen to be kept to create landmarks. We've got incredible new things like the gantry, which are there to do a whole lot of jobs. We've got amazing swales that are looking after the rainwater and sending it back to the harbour better than, better than when it came in. So there's a huge amount of thought behind how these places come together. Often say it's not, like, not unlike making a painting where you're considering every single brush stroke that goes into what that audience sees. And as you might know our North Wolf piano. I know painted pianos are a thing all over the place and acknowledging Luke Jerram and a, and a work called Play Me, I'm Yours, which is where the idea stems from. This is our first piano. It was painted by an incredible artist called Christy Wade, who I believe is now incredibly famous. And we knew her when she was, you know, just starting out. Um, but this is the first day that we put that piano out there. And this young man turned up and we thought, oh gosh, he's going to hit it with a hammer because he looked a little bit dodgy. Um, and then he sat down and just started playing. And he was a self-taught musician who was living in his car, working for uh, Sealant at the time. And he became a kind of a local celebrity. He'd just turn up and play. And people would try and put money in his boots and it'd make him really angry. He just wanted to play his music. But a good example for me in the early days of doing this job of how creativity can just shift how people see a place. And sometimes those medium and small gestures are the ones that are the most powerful. This is the realm we're working in in place making. Polar bears, that's right. Um, this is not the polar bear from the zoo when I was small, but it's like the polar bear from the zoo when I was small. And I remember that polar bear dancing and we always thought it was a happy polar bear because he'd be like, you know, getting his groove on. That was me trying to sound cool. I won't do that again during this speech. Um, turns out the polar bear wasn't happy. The polar bear had a thing called zoocosis because it was in a very warm, gray, concrete environment, which is not where polar bears like to live. And zoocosis is a condition that animals get that turns them off their food, makes them stop breeding, makes them pretty angry, and generally sends them into not a very well state of being. So my question is, if we're animals, how do environments like this make us feel in our, sub, you know, our, our deeper brains, our more animal brains, in my daily walk along Fanshawe Street? So this is kind of the, the realm we're working in, in placemaking, is we want to kind of try and do a better job than this for the people of Auckland. And remembering that the environments you are in and you are walking through are giving you subconscious cues about how welcome you are in a place or not. They're telling you at the very base of your brain whether or not you're safe, whether or not you're welcome, whether or not the people around you can be trusted. And all this kind of thinking has been a little bit absent in some of our city making over the years. So for placemaking for Panuku, we, 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 we say we don't have a set of instructions. We have a set of principles and values. And um, I, know, I know you're gonna share these slides later, so I won't go into the depth of what this thing says. But this is what we carry into all of our work, these, these sort of, this, this layering of how we might think about how we build place. But that one in the middle, hopefully sounding familiar to you, this is the most important thing. How do we connect with actual emotion and think about how we're making places with care so that people can be better for the work that we do? And we're incredibly, incredibly lucky, especially within the Council Fano and, and Panuku, to have to be working on building a strong partnership with Mana Whenua and how we do this. And we, we only have those values because our Mana Whenua partners helped us find them and didn't gift them to us, loaned them to us. And we're still working through how we honour that that loaning in, in the right way. But we are in an incredible place in this country, having an indigenous people uh, and a knowledge which was nearly erased because of some parts of our history. But um, maybe there's a resurgence, maybe there's a, there's a respecting happening now, and maybe there's something in that for us all. We talk a lot about the Māori identity as being the unique proposition that Auckland has, especially in our strategic documents. But the question kind of is, is how deeply do we mean that and how, how prepared are we to step into what that could actually mean in terms of a different way of being. This, this whakatauki is from, I believe it's Ngāti Whātua, I could have that wrong, forgive me, aroha mai. But this idea that, that you should always be paying attention to what's come before you and that will inform you better walking into the future. I'm not convinced that's the way we've been doing a lot of city building. Seems a little bit more that we're inclined to kind of erase what went before us and do something new for whatever reason. Clean slate, flattening, these are words we, we seem to use a bit. But maybe we're losing something in that. Maybe we're missing some knowledge from our ancestors and from those that have gone before. And so this journey, being a placemaker for Panuku, has sent me into my own journey. And I'll be brave enough to share this with you again. Thank, thank you thank you for creating a safe space. But this idea of whakapapa, which we know in this country, and what that means to be connected to place, is, is a pretty deep journey to go on if you're, if you're, if you're brave. And yeah, uh, I'm, I'm pretty Scottish, I already sort of said that but I, I sent myself to Scotland a couple of years ago when it was still legal to travel overseas, <laughs> promise, uh, and found out that my name means footpath. That was quite exciting. 
made for some very confused older men in the Outer Hebrides. Um, but what I also found, Scotland, there we go, that's just a traditional photo of Scotland for you. Um, what I did find was a very strange experience, especially in a place called Sky. This is, this is just below the Kulin Mountains in Sky, where I suddenly felt different about the land I was standing on. And I suddenly understood what my friend Lucy Tukua means when she says, I know where my bones are from. And I knew that my bones were from here. I knew I had a different relationship to these rocks, to this water. And I came home feeling quite different about the word place making as a result. And I've ended up, sorry, I've ended up reading quite a lot of books that have sent me on quite a few odd journeys. But if I can highly recommend, I think it's Soil and Soul, forgive me, there's an error on this slide. Um, but this idea of if community are involved in the making or indeed in this instance, the saving of their place, their relationship to that place becomes incredibly different. And nothing I need to tell this audience but we we're in we're not in a great place as a species right now this is an image from Glasgow I think in the 1950s um, Scotland's done a lot of work on how to build better places for humans um, sorry terrible slide but it, I, I constantly uh, you know am a bit rude about Australia you shouldn't need a national child protection week there's something deeply wrong in how we're wired as humans when we need to start having weeks like this but we have become the dominant species over the last couple of hundred thousand years because not our opposable thumbs, not our ability to use Tinder, but actually our ability to collaborate. It is not survival of the fittest, Darwin never said that. It's about an adaptation and collaboration that's meant that we've got to this place. So maybe, maybe human genius can get us out of this mess. So back to the strap line, and what does it mean now for me? And maybe the definition of placemaking needs to get a little bit deeper than attracting people to a place. Um, highly recommend reading Sharon Blackie uh, her books are pretty game-changing, especially if you're a lady on a kind of a re matronizing journey. But yeah, this idea that it's a lot deeper than food trucks and AstroTurf, and it's actually about reconnecting ourselves to place. I want to give a quick speech about regeneration, which is what we say we are as an agency, and we're, we're talking from a perspective of regenerative practice. And um, last year, I got flown... No, going backwards, sorry. Just, there we go, that's the slide I wanted to. Last year, I had to go up to London to speak to, with a group to uh, the Commonwealth uh, Secretariat. Not freaky at all, just talking in front of the Secretary General of the Commonwealth in, in Commonwealth House. Pretty spooky, the heart of colonisation, as somebody wisely said. But it felt right today to actually share that exact speech with you guys. So if you bear with me, I'll start reading overtly. Um, this is the place I work for. This is Auckland city centre waterfront around 12 years ago. An incredibly important place for our marine sectors with major land ownership by Auckland Council and a place of great significance for our indigenous people, mana whenua, a place of great potential. In 2011, stage one opened, focused on public space, commons and connection to the water. My first instruction from my first manager was to make sure people like it, Frith. I'm incredibly proud to say that to this day, when I tell people what I do, their response is always, I love that place. We placemakers know that our work is to help people, help build people's relationships with their places. This proof of concept of a place-led approach saw us made into Panuku Development Auckland. Now we work across the region on multiple projects at several scales. We begin in each place by gathering information. This is an early snapshot of what we learned about a place called Monaco. The yellow border, affectionately known as the T-shirt, shows our project area. I, speak, I suspect you can make out the roads because we love our roads in Auckland. There is also a wee blue line making its way up through the bottom half. That is the Puhanui stream. Very early on, this natural waterway was identified as being a hu of huge import to the project, but it represented a very complex undertaking. We recognised quickly that we could not simply work with the water that was in our project area, because that's not really how water works. The Puhanui travels from a healthy state in Totoro Park down through increasing levels of degradation and pollution until it meets the ocean in the Manukau Harbour. Both of these images are of the Puhanui, one from up near the source and one from the middle of our project area. Just like to ask to see if you can feel a difference between the two. As I said, this is a complex project with many, many important players. Individually, we do not have all the skill sets, mandates and answers. We need each other. We know we have to be comfortable working with ambiguity. This is the new normal. We said this pre-COVID, by the way. Together we can test and trial new ideas and ways of working. At Panuku, we call this do, learn, do. Responding effectively to climate change requires an intergenerational perspective, working together with the communities we serve. Mana whenua have the knowledge, mā tauranga, to work this way and are key essential partners in this work. Some very clear messages from our youngest collaborators in the work there. We are seeking long-term meaningful solutions, solutions the place and its people truly want and deserve. 
which brings me back to a word I began with, love. This is our company's vision, and I know that it is possible if our work comes from a loving place. I think Einstein said, a new type of thinking is essential if mankind is to survive and move towards higher levels. We are all indigenous to this planet, but some of us have forgotten what that means and how to be it. We are trying to remember. Each of us needs to build feelings of relationships with the place we are living in right now. As we step further, sorry, 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 got excited there. As we step further into this uncertain future, we need each other. We need new living systems built on healthy, just, reciprocal relationships. We need love, aroha, peace, and hope for all. So to get a little bit wider than the placemaking just for Hanuku, just for those parts of Auckland, we're also working at a national level with the word and a network that's been about 12 years in the making. And I wanted to share this kawanata with you all. I know it's a little tricky to read. I've, I've put the fine print up there um, in terms of what this thing is for. But again, we wrote these words two, three years ago, and we're reading them now going, whoa, okay, they're quite important right about now. So this is kind of the, the key thing I think about this day job that I've got. It's about how we come together. It's about how you know who you are as a person and what you're bringing. What is your kaupapa and your mahi? How do you then fiercely collaborate with like-minded people to, to do things a bit differently? Because it's getting urgent now. But the potential of if we all came together and worked from these places of deep love for, for place, man, crikey, we might just be all right. And so transit. <laughs> I was thinking this morning, because yesterday I was listening to somebody talk a lot about transit-oriented developments, and I thought this morning, what if we weren't doing transit-oriented developments? What if we were doing well-being-orientated developments or, or whenua-orientated developments? What if transit didn't mean moving? And then I got out my dictionary. This is uh, about 1870, I think, this dictionary when it was first printed. This is what I do when I want to know what a word means, and this is what I found. So rather than thinking of transit as how you move, how you move from one place to another, or maybe even thinking about transit instead of the word change, that we're passing over here. The, the, the human species in a, is at a point of transit, of, of moving from one way of being to another. We all know this, and I know you all know this. But then what does that mean in terms of how we need to be right now? So I started thinking about transit not as in what happens when I get on a bus, but what happens if I start to think differently about how I connect to my, my job, my, my friends, my place? What happens then? This is from an artwork in Adelaide Festival, I think in about 2015. But my question, I guess, for the room today is, is, is how do we bring ourselves back together as humans and then beyond that, back into relationship with our home planet to remind ourselves that we are not merely passengers here. This is from the Common Earth website, this image, but um, in a quote from a, a book called uh, Post-Disciplinary Post Practice, Hard Work. How deeply are we able to unpick? How brave can we be in stepping back from each of our own current silo practices, back together, back to place, to look forward, and to know to just take the next step together with respect for all of the people who haven't been born yet. Thank you so much for your ears. I think it's time now, if it's all right with the bosses in the room, to go to questions and conversation. But um, yeah, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Back to Laura in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> Um, tēnā koe e hoa. Um, so we do have a couple of questions, and I'll actually keep this on you, oh, my dear. Um, and just to call, if you haven't yet dropped your question into the chat, make sure you do it now, and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. Um, we've also just had some really lovely messages from oh. people, which is always nice, so um, we'll make sure that Frith gets a chance to read them after the call. Um, so I'll put this on Frith because I'm going to lean this way so that I can read all of your messages. All right, so the first one is from Charlie, who would be interested to hear about a standout moment in your experience of placemaking and learning about placemaking where something just clicked and it was really powerful for you. Oh, wow, well, cool. Cool question, Charlie. I was actually, I instantly wanted to answer it by the thing I did worst ever, like my worst <laughs> ever mistake in learning how to do this job. It involved a car race called the Targa Rally. I'll let you think about that. Um, I actually want to say it's that, it, in, in this moment, Charlie, it's that moment with that piano. Um, it was this kind of, we'd spent... Crikey, we'd spent several months getting ready for this opening. And then there's this moment where I'm watching this boy play a piano and this boss that I have looks at me and goes, you've got this. And I didn't probably know it at the time, but that, that's the kind of stuff that I, I'm, I'm probably reaching back for. Awesome. Um, next from Rach. How, oh, good Hi, Rach. How do you get people to slow down and absorb <laughs> nature in a space? That's a really cool question. And I, I, I think the... The subtext of what you're saying is you don't necessarily have to be in a wilderness environment to, to be with nature. Um, I think there's a call to notice. I think that's the main thing. We have to start noticing better. 
we're always on a rush to get somewhere at the moment. We're always on a, you know, I'll be okay once I get over there or time, time, time. Um, I think probably it starts with knowing that we aren't separate to nature. We, we always make a joke about putting waste beyond the environment. Um, but na we're actually nature. Nature is us. Everything that I'm, it, all this room we're sitting in was extracted from nature. So it is all still nature. So how do we first and foremost recognise that we are part of it and then secondly recognise that, that, that um, it's all around us and then hopefully thirdly recognise a, a, a relationship with it. But yeah, beautiful question. Starts with noticing this daisy growing up through the crack in the footpath. I think, Rachel, if that's an okay answer. Awesome. Um, all right, next one is from Julian Andrews. He's got a <gasps> bit of a challenge for Hi, you, Julian actually. Andrews. <laughs> um, so Julian has always wanted to understand, thank you for abbreviating, WTF, because we're being recorded, the purpose of the gantry at Silo Park. Yeah, man. The challenge is, can you name the uses, as many of the uses as possible in 15 seconds? Five. It's a hinge. It represents all the different axes of the waterfront. It is an, an homage to our industrial past. It is a pathway to get you up so that you can look up and over that headland in the future planning. It is an option to not cross a road. And lastly, most importantly, it becomes a bit of a guide that you should stay within Silo Park and not wander on up to the industrial area up to the right there. I love it. And that wasn't even 15 seconds. Nailed oh, it. I've had to do that quite a lot. So <laughs> that's a question that one gets asked a bit. <laughs> that is awesome. All right. Um, from Brandon. Very much respect making spaces that embrace the history of an existing community. Do you consider new people too that may be looking to make somewhere home in place making? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Brandon, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, or, or, like, I, I mean, that's an honest thing to say to you guys, especially Brandon, is we are actually charged with increasing housing in all of these areas. So our number one job is adding new people in safe, beautiful, welcoming homes. So that's a really, we're right up against this at the moment and, and I'll be brave. We're, we're actively thinking we need to have a, Good conversation about gentrification how do you how do you bring new people into a place respect those that are there and help people stay in place age in place even so that the people coming in know the neighborhood they're moving into and are respectful and you know they want to integrate with that neighborhood um, it's really tricky and I think um, I, 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 um, you know you sort of look to your cousins and places like TRC and and Kainga Ora who are, who are in the same place we have to find more room for people to live in place and we have to try and maintain what is special about those places. Um, I think it probably does go back to that deep connection and, and the and the kind of the, the deep stories of place. Um, but then you also want new stories to come in and, and make those places more rich as a result. So don't have the answer yet, but it's a it's a live one. I hope it's about coming back to those common human values, the things that actually do unite us more than separate us, if that makes sense. Thank you. Choice question. Hard one, but choice. <laughs> I love that answer. Um, and it actually segues on really nicely because our next question is from Jade Tang-Taylor. And I know that Jade has been doing some incredible work with um, welcoming people in, I want to say in Te too, but forgive me, Jade, if that's wrong, into a new community there. Um, so Jade, has, her question is, how might we co-create and authentically co-design with grassroots community to regenerate their local communities when people are time poor and resource stretched? Yeah, yeah. Um, tips, advice, ideas. Yeah. Yeah, it's, man, I, I remember hearing a, a very powerful, I, I, got, I was allowed to go to Detroit in 2012 and there was a really blunt statement made by the arts fraternity there, like it's not our job to recreate your city and we're trying to make a living here. Um, and I think we do turn up in community and go, we're here to regenerate your place, what would you like? Um, and assume that our day job is their day job and that's incorrect. It's a be beautiful question, Jade. Um, I, think, I think also it's really important to say, there's a quote I heard uh, a couple of years ago, which is the community is the expert and the community isn't the expert. So I'm really clear that placemaking is not about going, everybody else shut up, community, what do you have to say? It's actually not about that at all. It's about undoing the effects of specialisation is the quote. So what I think we need to be able to do is come with all of our tools, um, completely respect that people are trying to live in these areas, so they don't want to just turn up to endless workshops where they're not being paid to tell us whatever it is we need to know today. But we're actually connecting with people on their terms and um, taking what they're able to give in a moment. And the most important thing is being able to hear when we can't hear everybody. We've definitely got a lot of places where there's people who feel really active and engaged in this conversation and you're super aware that there's heaps of people you can't hear. But mm -hmm. that going to people in their place and recognizing that I'm getting paid to do this day job but they're not, 
I just keep wanting to use the word respect, Jade. It's about respect for where everybody is and not just assuming that because we're here to redevelop a place means everybody else is ready for that. that, that that's, the, that's the deep answer here. We're very quick to just want to run our usual systems. You know, Here's my thing, I need your input, thank you very much. Um, that's, that's not how, it can't work like that anymore. It hasn't been working for a lot of people for a long time. We've actually got to look at a new way of wiring this job, I think, if that makes sense. Mm. I hope I answered that question. Thank you, Jade. Next is from Nolwen. So Hi, Nolwen! Thanks so much, Fras, for the presentation. Um, every, I'm just going to say blanket. Everyone's saying thanks so much for the oh. presentation. You're amazing. It's really inspiring. Oh. That's a blanket um, statement. <laughs> Do you have any advice on where to start to train yourself in the place oh. making field? Oh. Yes, <laughs> darling. No. <laughs> um, they've gone on to say any bibliography, movie, documentary, yeah. network references that you can share. Oh, really? Thank you. Um, look, the answer the answer is no. I'm a bit nervous about place making training. I feel like by the time we've got degrees in place making, we're going to need a new word. Um, the best the best thing. I, honestly, I've been told heaps that theatre people make the best placemakers <laughs> um, just because you're able to collaborate artists make the best placemaking because we know about I'm not an artist but we, but we know about collaboration and how to bring people together around a script if you think of places the scripts that's the way we do this so I think there's definitely I, I think probably sociology is a great place to study uh, anthropology all those sorts of deep brain sciences and then of course urban design and landscape architecture are important because really we're talking about public space here um, I really nearly stuck in the slides, which are my current favourite books. Um, so so def, def, you should read Happy City by Charles Montgomery. You absolutely should read um, William White. You should probably read Jane Jacobs. Uh, you should absolutely read Jane Jacobs, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Um, I personally believe the Lego movie, number one, is a, is a seminal film about placemaking. Just, just putting that out there. Thank you <laughs> Love and then, And then, as I said, Sharon Blackie and... Um, yeah, uh, Lewis Hyde, the, the Gift, was the other book that was really in my head this morning um, in terms of coming to do this presentation. Yeah. All right, from Layla. Learning to adapt yes. to new realities in the age of COVID, how is it affecting the work, um, building spaces, keeping it even more local, home and neighbourhood yeah, space? Yeah, cool. Um, you know, we, we know that when we had a procurement freeze at Auckland Council, we had a serious impact on the creative sectors because we'd been doing a lot of work and we had a whole, whole couple of sectors just in strife there and, and acknowledging all those people out there that are hanging in there and being brave. Um, I think I feel quite grateful that it's forcing us into a smaller conversation, that we, we're, we're being forced out of the thousands of people and into the local. And our chief executive, David Rankin, brought tears to my eyes yesterday. He said, COVID has reminded us of the importance of community and neighbourhoods. So this coming back to the small, almost my answer to, to um, Rachel's question, the coming back to the small is what's important here, and that's what we're noticing. Not just because budgets are being cut, because they are, um, but also because we're going, oh, hang on, it's those tiny connections that mean something in this environment. And the big stuff doesn't hold us together like that. So I think that's the key pivot. Also, we keep saying is that COVID was a dress rehearsal, right? That was planet Earth going, hey, wake up. <laughs> so us being ready for more uncertainty is really important. So what, what keeps you safe in your neighbourhood and in your whānau? That's, that's where placemaking ought to be operating, which is exciting. Scary, but exciting. Awesome. Um, oh, they just keep coming. How do you, Sash Panuku, manoeuvre through the various council, government, stakeholders to achieve the best outcome for a project? With love. <laughs> um, look, there's a, there are so many officers throughout the council group and indeed the, the, the government groups that are just dedicated to doing a better job and a good job. And, you know, all, all the words I've told you today are, are words that we all, you know, Lots of, they've come from lots of people. It is not easy, and a lot of the systems are built to almost deter you from collaboration, which is super interesting. But stuff like the Innovating Streets Fund from NZTA, um, Waka Kotahi, that is built to help us with those systems. So that joke that we're pretty much running a 1950s kind of way of thinking, possibly not that funny. Um, probably Vogons aren't that funny anymore, now that you sort of know about, but all of these systems are, uh, are up in the, you know, they've all been challenged this year, which is sort of, marvelously scary but with a great it's that fierce collaboration statement i made before eh? it's like we all are lucky enough to be paid to work for our city so make that count that's the that's the that's the key clarion call i think awesome. thank you cool question rebecca has then asked how do you practically involve the community in the placemaking process yep. or wish you could if there was no red tape <laughs> good good so, yeah yeah um i'll just answer that first but um 
by being on the ground is the really simple answer. You have to you have to be actually on the paddock, and this is why that do learn do thing is really important for us. As you go and you start doing stuff on the space small, and then you start to meet people. You, you start off by, you know, there's, there's you go in with who you know the key players, and then you just meet people, meet people, meet people. But you be on the paddock and you be there consistently, and you have open ears and open arms. That's the way to do it. Yeah, I'm super lucky to get to work with an incredible team of placemakers in Tanuku who are just a thousand million percent dedicated to their places and really care about the outcomes. And they're just there on the paddock doing the, doing the stuff. Um, we have one last question. I actually cut off Julian's one earlier. My bad. Sorry, Julian. Um, people like all people like us ever do is talk about breaking down silos. Do you think it's time to rename Silo Park? Oh, I love that Silo Park has a set of six silos that are interconnected. Like if you go inside <laughs> Silo Six, you're like, hang on, these things are deeply connected. Um, I also think probably silo breaking, it's sort of, it doesn't really mean anything if you don't think about the human relationships. Um, so you, you're absolutely right. I, oh, and I, sorry, a quick story here is when I first started working for Silo Park, I'd just come from working from Silo Theatre and I wasn't very popular. And Silo Theatre was getting a lot of phone calls about the movie that was being screened. So I did try to rename Silo Park in the early days and it, it, it didn't happen. Um, I kept getting reminded that there were 35 metre high silos in the park and that was called Silo Park. So <laughs> I promise I did try. <laughs> Um, amazing. Go and inside Silo 6 and sing a song. That would be my, that would be my recommendation. That is such a great recommendation.